want to thank you, for, first of all, for that speech, which is, um, I think, worthy of the occasion, to say the least. It's uh, been extraordinarily comprehensive in its uh, treatment. It's been very serious uh, in its analysis, and uh, I think very significant as well in terms of its prescription. We've heard a speech which is not just analytical, but also prescriptive, and I think uh, that's a fairly unique combination. It's important that it should be so, because we've got to deal with um, solutions having identified, as we think, the problem. I think the tone that you have, um, which animated the entire speech, was set very early on, where you called for a reform of the uh, ECB, the establishment of a common budget, and the return of the community method, and the re-establishment of what you call the pro-European uh, consensus. And I think from that standpoint, um, your various proposals will have to be evaluated, I think correctly so. Um, can I just, maybe just to ask you one point, uh, just in, in relation to the uh, federal impetus, might, might it be said, of your proposals, uh, to what extent do you think that um, member states would be, would be willing to go this extra stage in terms of sharing sovereignty? by the creation of a real European Central Bank, uh, the lender of last resort, as you constantly refer to it, uh, and of the downgrading as, well, not downgrading, but repositioning of their central banks, uh, which you quite li rightly identified, um, allied to the creation of the fiscal union along the lines that you uh, were outlining. To what, I mean, there's, a, there's a very major step uh, involved here. And to what extent do you think that, from your experience, member states would be willing to make that step? challenges, but the bottom line is we have to learn from crisis. Uh, and we're all agreed that this is a unique crisis. Uh, most of the articles I read and literature I read have all pointed to the flawed design of the euro, uh, and indeed the need uh, to strengthen and broaden the mandate of, of the central bank. Uh, and I suppose if, if I'm frustrated by anything, it's, it's the reluctance to translate the analysis into firm, proactive action. Um, and um, I get the sense, and I haven't been at the meetings, but I get the sense that this is the one issue that has not been put center stage and has not been advanced, and that the narrow issue of controlling <coughs> fiscal balances has been the sole agenda for f too long since the crisis emerged. Um, and if, if, it's, if there's general agreement that the design <coughs> is flawed, then we need to correct that for sustainability into the future. In terms of winning over member states, um, that would be very challenging, but we haven't even commenced the debate. It hasn't even been raised, to the best of my knowledge, at council meetings. Um, and I'm arguing strongly uh, that until we actually deal fundamentally with that issue, we're going to have continuing issues with the sustainability of the Eurozone. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, I <coughs> abuse the position of the chair slightly to put the, put the first question. Um, I now invite <coughs> questions and our comments from uh, members of the Institute. And in the normal way, um, you will identify who it is you are. And if you are in the unfortunate position of representing some organization, you would indicate who that organization is. I do stress this is not a press conference. This is a question and answer session with the uh, members of the Institute. There is a roving mic here. And if you'd like to indicate, and there are two roving mics, I'd like to indicate uh, that you want to put a question or make a comment, please do so now, and I'll take. OK, so I have three hands going up. And can I just take, I think it's Tony Brown, then I'll come over to Ronan. Tony Brown, yeah, and then Ronan. Very comprehensive speech. And um, I think it's very uh, significant that the leader of Fianna Fáil is with us 50 years after Sean Lamas, probably one of the greatest leaders this country has had, uh, took the great initiative of, 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 of the application uh, to join the, the, the union. Uh, the question I, I want to put is, in your opening remarks, you referred to four headings, and you, you, you mentioned the community method. You didn't develop that specifically, but uh, my personal view is that this is one of the, the critical issues facing us, particularly in relation to the role of the European Commission, which is the body we've always placed a lot of faith in, and it's the body from which uh, small and medium-sized countries can, can play a role and have their voice listened to, and I would just like to hear what you, you, ha you have to say about that, because I think uh, it, it is another matter that is not sufficiently debated, but which is critical for the, the, the developments along the lines that you're talking about. I would, I would agree with your 
uh, analysis and, if I'm honest, I think in the post-Lisbon architecture that has emerged, or the dynamic maybe that has emerged, there's a very strong sense that the commission, the commission's authority are, um, has been somewhat sidelined um, and that the intergovernmentalism has, has trumped that uh, and the balance is wrong. Um, and that that is an issue we should be very concerned about. And I think the Commission, and I think member states need to reaffirm and reassert the Commission's role um, in terms of, of, of the community method. I also think attitudes have to change. Um, and this links into the issue of public attitudes to the EU, because what they read and what they see and the dynamics of what they see influences their thinking. Um, do we all, in other words, have a genuine input? Or is it, you know, the famous Marcosi sort of duo, is that what's dictating the pace? And I think there's a balance to that, but the bottom line, that's what people are picking up in the optics and the, um, in the symbols of, of, of how things are emerging, uh, emerging and evolving. Uh, so I think member states have to um, work together um, in terms of reasserting the role of the commission and having it as a key pillar in terms of bringing people together and setting the agenda uh, on a number of fronts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised by your remarks, actually, and I think our chairperson with his noted statesperson-like uh, uh, approach wouldn't use the word radical, but I, I thought it was a very radical federalist uh, speech, actually. <laughs> and in fairness, uh, common sense, if we're honest about the nature of the European economy at the moment, needs that kind of approach. And unfortunately, the politics doesn't quite... Uh, make it very viable at the moment because, as has been rightly said, nobody's actually advocating for it. The fact is the European Union has been a major driver for the European economy in all countries. And which country has benefited most? Germany, of course, because Germany is the biggest beneficiary of the single market, and the Germans have one wonderful advantage. They're a strong economy, but they have a very competitive currency. And look at our Chinese friends, the problems they have trying to force down their currency. They get into all sorts of trouble. They're rightly accused uh, under international trade practices or perhaps engaging a bit too much aggression in that, in that, but they are showing commendable flexibility of late, of course. The point is, how can you achieve the level of transfers that will help states that must pursue austerity policies achieve growth. You need a real federalist model like you've suggested, a real fiscal union. The tragedy at the moment is nobody is prepared to uh, confront that economic reality. It's common sense in the current situation. And admittedly, it's easy in opposition, of course, it may well be said, and I'd be the first person to acknowledge that. And it's, but it's, at least we, we got a welcome that you are actually saying that. And until more of us are prepared to acknowledge the facts of the situation, we are not going to move forward. Because as we see with the Irish economy, austerity policies, countries that must cut back, must balance their books, who are vulnerable of large debts, that's, that's unavoidable. We do need a fiscal situation, however, that will provide funds for growth. And as you've pointed out, that can only be done at the federal level. But in the current architecture of Europe, we need a legal basis because countries in a position to fund that obviously are not going to do without security. So at least this is a contribution to the start of a debate. Uh, thank you for that opportunity. Well, thank you uh, for, for your comments. I'm, uh, I take the point you're making in terms of the, of the challenges that lie ahead in bringing that together. Now, there's been suggestions that this treaty is an incremental step towards that. I made that point in my speech that implied is some suggestion that there will be post-treaty flexibility and changes and so on. Now, I think that, that in itself, I would argue, is not enough. Uh, and I think really it's up to member states to actually start putting these issues in, in bilateral discussions with other states. You know, first of all, create an agenda that we agree with start proactively arguing, the, arguing and presenting the points to other member states. Um, we're not alone, actually, in, in, in having these views um, in, in, in terms of what needs to be done. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be part of the agenda at the, at the moment. Um, and it seems to be all about you know, getting the fiscal thing under control first. Um, and there, there are domestic political pressures in every state, uh, coming at politicians in different states from different vantage points and so on. And just in, as in here in Germany, they have their political issues as well, to be fair. Uh, and they have uh, challenges on that domestic front. But equally, you've, you've articulately summed it up, the euro is very, very important to Germany as well uh, as to any other state um, within the eurozone. And I would have thought that there's significant incentive in that uh, and motivation uh, to move rapidly uh, towards this agenda. Okay, Tom Hawley, I don't know. 
Uh, firstly, thanks. Um, Tom Hawhey, member of the Institute. Um, I would like to thank you for a, a, a splendid contribution to the debate and one which I, I know will be seriously uh, poured over here in the House and, and uh, enter into the, the internal discussions. Um, but it seems to me that we're in a situation the house is on fire. <laughs> it started in an outhouse, it moved to the kitchen, it's now in the lounge. Uh, radical and immediate action is necessary. Uh, the, the people with the necessary resources, the fire hoses, <laughs> uh, happen to be uh, our German friends uh, together with the French. Now, they could have handled it better, I think in particular, if I may say so, President Sarkozy could have handled it better in terms of the uh, imagery that has gone out right around the Union. Uh, so instead of this being a, a, an emergency action, preparing the way for uh, further uh, discussions between all the members of the family about a better way to run our affairs, it has created the impression of imposing uh, a view on the rest of Europe. However, we still need to put the fire out. and. Certainly, I think from an Irish point of view, if we don't put the fire out, in other words, if we don't ratify the treaty, uh, we will be caught up uh, in the blaze, rightly or wrongly. I, I, that's the way, the, the way I see it. So um, the debate, I think, has to take that into consideration. Th thank you very much. But I think I made my position clear in terms of, of the treaty itself. Uh, in terms of our position as a political party, in terms of supporting the treaty. We have put questions to the Taoiseach. We've sought important clarifications now in terms of timescales in relation to the 160th rule, uh, in, in terms of debt, getting your debt down to, or the 120th, down to 60%, um, to the structural deficit. There are important issues there, but as I said clearly, um, we support fiscal controls. We supported the six-pack, uh, stability and growth, and so on. Um, but we equally have said consistently since March we think this is missing the point, and we don't, this, we don't believe that the fiscal treaty in itself is putting out the fire, basically. It needs uh, much, much more to put the fire out. That's our concern, really. Um, and I understand the real politic of what you're saying, but I think we need to be clear to people as well. Um, because the one thing I learned from the Lisbon debate, really, we did enormous research into public attitudes uh, about Europe and about Lisbon 1 and so on, and it has actually informed my thinking a lot. And maybe if you're not as close to it, you wouldn't be as possessed of this idea of, of really taking the argument to people. You know, people thought you'd never again pass the second Lisbon Treaty, actually, after Lisbon 1 was defeated. And that was the conventional wisdom. In-house as well as out-house. I mean, ministers would say to you, we'll never get this through, uh, and so forth. But we did, actually. Now, far better preparation for the second one than the first one. Far greater research, greater understanding of where people were, modifying, getting the protocols to reflect where people were in the first, and engaging with people, uh, and winning the argument. Um, and and I, I think we should never underestimate our capacity to do that, or never approach a, a viewpoint from saying it can never be won, and therefore we must avoid putting it before the people. Um, that's just a, a view I have, and I. I suppose the, the Lisbon uh, experience influenced me. I would acknowledge that things are more difficult now. Acknowledge that, not uh, naive or, or, or in any way uh, discounting uh, the significant you know, negative opinion because of the collapse. It happens in general economic collapse. But if we're fairly sure, and this treaty envisages a treaty in five years' time, you know, and if we are, have a view that this is heading in a direction of more substantive change, then I think we're better off being a bit upfront with people. And we, at this phase, we are committing future parliaments. Maybe not strictly legally, but we're committing future parliaments to budgetary parameters, certainly for the next decade or so. And that's the position. So the arguments, political arguments in, uh, around uh, engaging with the people on this. Um, but our, our fundamental view on the fiscal treaty, I don't think the fiscal treaty will put the fire out. But I take your point, those who have the firepower to put the fire out um, do see it as a necessary step in, uh, on, on the road. Um, and, 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 and their view has to be taken into account, plus the fact that access to the ESM is vital. Uh, Alan Jukes, member of the Institute, and I represent, as far as I know, only a very gloomy me at the moment. Um, 
I must say, I, I agree with the three objectives that Deputy Martin has put forward. Um, reform the European Central Bank, set up a real fiscal union, and restore the community method. But if I may say so, to a Corkman, uh, I'd use the Kerry phrase, if I were going there, I wouldn't start from here. We are doing all of those things in the very worst possible circumstances. There's been a total abdication by 15 heads of state and government since early in 2010 uh, to Merkel and Sarkozy. So it's an uphill battle to get any idea of a community method restored here. The same uh, with uh, fiscal solidarity. The reality of the situation that we're in now, ugly as it is, is that whatever we do or say about this fiscal compact, it is going to be European Union practice uh, for, for, for some time, because once 12 member states ratify it, it, it comes into effect. It's actually going to fall apart fairly quickly, I would think. It has no effect uh, for the programme countries at the moment, because the programmes supersede this. And my suspicion is that when the next French government and the next German government see what they're facing, uh, with the 0.5% structural deficit target and the 120th adjustment of the margin by which their borrowing requirement exceeds 60%, they are going to find that they don't like the kind of austerity program that that means for them. And I think that was very well brought out in Pather O'Brien's recent paper produced for the Institute. There's a very telling table in there uh, that shows just where the member states are in relation to these. My guess is that this treaty um, will fall apart as a matter of practice within two years. Uh, we've already seen that the possible next president of France is making the same mistake as the current Taoiseach of this country made before an election in saying that we will renegotiate everything uh, once we get into government. And I think they will have just as much success uh, in the one case as, as, as in the other. Um, we are going to be pressing for the kind of solution that Michal has outlined in the very worst possible circumstances. Um, and the, the debate we're going to have about what we do next here in the short term is going to affect how we do it. I gather from, from what you've said uh, that if there is a referendum, Fianna Fáil will campaign for a yes vote. Um, it would help if uh, you could deal with some of the ill-informed speculation. Uh, for example, that indulged in by Willie O'D last Sunday week in the Sunday Independent. Uh, but I think that if we're going to get a result on this um, that gets over the fact that we're campaigning for something that's going to come into effect whether we like it or not, but we're campaigning for a, a longer-term objective, we're going to have to be very careful with the presentation. The final point I'd make is that while I agree the idea of post-treaty flexibility after we pass this is not enough, the fact is that that is the only, if you like, element of a, a silver lining in this cloud. And small as it is, it is something that we are going to have to take into account, not only in the national debate here, but also in the kind of debate that's going to be needed with other member states to motivate them to get out of the trap that they're setting for themselves. Well, I think more observations than, than, than and I would, I would agree with quite a lot of what, of what Alan has said. I'm not so sure it will fall apart that quickly, uh, although we, have, we do know from experience, particularly in 2005, that, that others, particularly larger states, actually did break um, and breach the limits uh, in the Stability and Growth Pact. And I think, I think what's important in any bill like this, actually, is that there is some sensible latitude too, you know. Uh, I mean, even in Spain now, in terms of the six pack, there's discussions going on in terms of room for maneuver, in terms of the exactitude of the levels that Spain are being asked to adhere to. You know, so already, even though we passed all of this, people are having a debate as to, well, do you really want to push it to, um, to total precision in terms of, of, of what um, figure they must em emerge in the deficit this year? And then, so it has to be common sense. But the trends have to be in the right direction. So we favour the fiscal control agenda, the idea of ultimately narrowing, obviously, the gap between expenditure and revenue. We do think that's a necessary part of what we're about. This speech was about setting our stall out unambiguously in terms of our position on the treaty. 
Uh, we've had our own meeting and discussion internally as a party. Um, we've been very, I mean, I, I would, the, one of the figures that we've been making what I would like to think are fairly serious contributions to all dial debates on this subject since last March. Uh, and we've been raising these issues um, in the context of those debates uh, as part of our contribution. I think what is needed, though, what I'm, I have been disappointed about is the lack of any engagement in advance. I do think we should have had a proper forum on the treaty in the Dáil. Um, even in, and that's new, breaking new ground in the sense of in advance of treaties. But for Lisbon, we actually set up a specific subgroup of the European Affairs Committee to um, hear, have hearings on Lisbon to invite people from outside, and that hasn't happened on this occasion. I met every single party as foreign minister prior to Lisbon too. I met Sinn Féin, even though I knew their ultimate position would be negative. I met with independent senators, independent TDs, um, to put the, the case to them, to invite their suggestions. I met Billy Timmons and Joe Costello, I would have met with regularly on behalf of Finnegan and Labour. That's missing now, to be frank. Uh, we had one meeting, that was after the December summit. And I, that's what I'm really getting at when I talk about the poor EU mainstream opinion, both politically and with the people. That needs to happen. And there needs to be engagement. And that's why, if, before any treaty, there should be consultation in advance in the Doyle and hear people out. Um, and um, even if they are coming from a position which is not yours, or they might be a negative and against it, I think we have to um, take people through the issues and interrogate the, the views that people have, um, notwithstanding how they may eventually uh, in, in, end up. Um, I think the silver lining, I, I take your point on that. It, it, I hope that is the case. I sincerely hope that that is the case. Um, and your comments on elections and politicians is always beware, I think is what you seem to be saying. Um, uh, and you were one of the more commendable practitioners of the art, um, you know, in terms of talent and so on. Um, but I've noted the French Prime Minister's, uh, or sorry, uh, the Socialist leader's comments. Well, I'm also minded, you know, before the last general election, the Conservatives had, had particular strong views in terms of the need for a referendum in Lisbon, which never materialised subsequently, you know. So we'll see what materialises on that front. But um, uh, I just want, sorry, one final, uh, the context. What was very interesting, why did people change from Lisbon 1 to Lisbon 2? Did, it, they weren't freshly imbued with a new EU idealism, to be honest, but the research indicates very strongly that the gathering storm clouds was the prime motivating factor behind people switching, or that sufficient portion that switched from no to yes second time. Around. So sometimes the context, grim and all as it is, uh, can actually move people in, 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 a, in a different direction than, than you might expect. And, and that actually, you take all the, the campaigning and the preparation, but the fundamental um, influence actually was the gathering storm clouds for, uh, economically and financially that people were aware of, and they basically said we're better in than out uh, in terms of their attitude to Lisbon. Thank you very much. Torek Murphy at the top corner here. <coughs> Left. Yes, another member of the Institute, I'm afraid, Paul Murphy. Um, I too was very encouraged by uh, your speech and um, the evidence that it gave of uh, commitment by your party to the European project, which has been a feature of all Irish governments for the past 50 years. If I can act the devil's advocate a bit, um, in uh, talking about the um, the aspect of uh, the uh, resolution of the problem which focuses on uh, the need for austerity. Um, I wonder about the, the bigger context which uh, consists of uh, a great inflation of official debt over the last 30 years. Uh, there's a huge overhang of official uh, debt in the system and part of the mechanism by which uh, the system has carried on up to now uh, consisted in a confidence on the part of one of the essential actors, uh, that's to say what's called the markets, uh, that this would, uh, was always, uh, let's say, triple A grade. That has ended uh, quite clearly. Um, and you say that um, in the case of other countries, um, I take it you mean the United States and Great Britain. Uh, they have been uh, able to use their central banks, the Fed or the Bank of England, as the bank of last resort. But what they are actually doing is actually building up this uh, of official debt further. Uh, and I wonder whether we can uh, deal with the problem 
uh, in uh, the kind of way that many here are talking about uh, without uh, actually uh, throttling this dragon by the throat before we do anything else. The, I think the key word is confidence. Um, and I mean, Italian debt was no worse 10 years ago than it is today. Uh, yet the collapse of confidence has created the crisis in, in terms of market confidence in Italy. So you do need, I think, a policy platform and strategy and decisiveness in terms of trying to bring the confidence back. And I would argue that the drip, drip sort of approach going back over the 18 months to two years, even the denials about Greece, you know, that it, it, won't, need a bit, you know, it won't need to default and so on, like that proved erroneous. And I think that has eroded confidence even further. Um, and it's a very intangible thing, confidence. Um, and um, th 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 there's, there's no clear sort of definition of what, what, when it arrives and when it leaves and so on, but I do think um, a clear, certain strategy followed by decisive action, I think would restore confidence. Um, I do believe that. Um, and notwithstanding, I mean, there's, there's no easy way to resolve, and there has been a huge buildup of debt and so on. Uh, you're absolutely correct in that. But, I'm, I'm, but I, I, I'm clear on this much, so far what we've been doing hasn't um, sufficed. Although I do think that you know, there, there's many elements to resolving this. And I think that's, if, if we're right about the silver lining, that maybe this is the essential first step that people want, and then other things will follow, we'll see. Um, but I think there are a number of components to this, which I do think is um, one of the key components is broadening the mandate of the, of the European Central Bank, and also a fiscal uh, transfer union. Okay. William Sky, member of the Institute. Uh, I don't want to bore people with my views. I think I said recently that this was the wrong treaty at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. Now, that, that doesn't mean that in the end of the day, I hope it will be superseded, that it would be rendered meaningless, that it might be renegotiated, but that in the end of the day, if I was asked, I would say I probably would support it out of fear, you see, and it is, would be out of fear. Be not, there's, there's no, there is no other merit if you're pursuing a national interest, as both the chairperson and yourself said. But uh, secondly, I just want to say, I mean, you've given me, I don't want to follow any party political points, but you've given us a few occasions of temptation, if not occasions of sin. However, we, 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 we leave that aside for the minute. What I really wanted to ask was, is, you know, are we realistic at all, talking about reforms? You're, this treaty is about power. It's, and it's also about belief. It's about belief among creditor countries, which led by Germany and a lot of others, with a lot of supporters, even in countries like Ireland, that what the periphery and what recalcitrant countries fiscally need is discipline. Even though I totally agree with a lot of your analysis that this is not the base cause of the problem at all. But that is there. The Germans have as much intention of reforming the European Central Bank as we have, in the short term at any rate, as we have of invading the Isle of Man. Uh, and uh, that, would be, uh, that, that, that would be my view. Now, that doesn't mean that out of necessity, they may not allow, and arguably in December they have, the central bank, the ECB, to do things they weren't doing up to now. But I, I think what, I, what I'm really bothered about is formalism. European Union is a meaningless phrase to most people. And your design, for, uh, the design analysis, and Colin McCarthy, and it's very interesting, your design analysis, but that it was flawed design. But was it a flawed design? In the sense that some people would say that Cohen and Mitterrand knew that this would happen, and the whole thing was to push a European Union in, in a much fuller sense that you've been saying. But that might, you might have had six or nine or 12, not 27, from Romania to Portugal to Greece to wherever. And that, uh, you, you know, that. Your, the, the European Union thing, in other words, if it's to be read, is long term, whereas nothing that is coming out in the policy sense out of European institutions at the minute gives any message. The growth and job stuff is waffle. It is, you know, not, it, maybe it can be substantiated, but it is waffle. Ireland can do nothing because Ireland is in hock and is a creditor country. It can say things, but they don't mean anything. So you, 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 you have to try to come as to how can you 
incrementally substantiate things because you are not going to get, in my view, a great leap forward given the current power disposition in Europe. For first point on that, I would say, I mean, added to fear, you can add necessity. Necessity is a great motivator for action. And ultimately, Germany will want the euro to survive. And in my view, will do what's required, ultimately, to save the euro. Now, it'll have to come to a juncture to make those decisions. But, um, and it may come in different forms and different ways. But I do believe that Germany believes in saving the euro. I, I passionately believe in that. I think also I've made a point earlier that there are, I think the euro was a political project too early, perhaps, and didn't match. And, and the issue about, I, I think it was, and I'm not an economist or not an expert, but if you look, even at our economic cycle, let's be clear, the cheap money came at the wrong time, the, the low interest rates, and we were growing. And you know, a wall of cheap money came across Europe, and there was further low cost money across the United States post 9-11, <coughs> um, and across all the developed economies, um, which I think did create um, um, both um, credit issues subsequently, but also the property bubble and the periphery, and particularly here. I think it was, it was a determining factor. I mean, uh, in this country, we joined the euro. We also promoted bank competition, if you remember, and it was conventionally agreed that it was a good thing. But unfortunately, bank competition ushered in significant bank competition, but all focused on property. Uh, and I remember even as an enterprise minister having, you know, when we, we think about it, we actually had to create our own state venture capital fund to support software companies, food companies, uh, new startup companies, and so forth because of the absence of private sector equity and the absence of a private venture capital fund industry in this country. And it kind of tells a lot when you look back, you know, all the money was heading into land uh, and property all the time. Even some of the food companies were becoming property companies, um, uh, which was really a retrograde situation. Um, and so I think there was clearly evidence, there is evidence of a flawed design in how the euro started. Um, I think uh, on the other hand for us as a country on the periphery, it had huge, powerful um, positives as well in terms of the trading agenda. Um, and most business people you, you speak will say that to you in terms of ease of trade, uh, access to markets, and so on. So it had a very positive impact on Ireland. So I, um, and, and fear, by the way, is the greatest motivator of all. Uh, as, I, as I discovered in education psychology when I was back in a different profession, the greatest motivator in passing an exam is still fear of failure uh, in, in an exam. <laughs> Various psychologists will testify to that, but let's move. But I think we have to be a bit. There are other elements to it um, as, as, as well, and um, and I think I'm not so sure. I mean, there have been great leap forwards in the past. Uh, don't underestimate the capacity that they'll happen again. Uh, but I, I do. I, I don't. I'm not naive. There are very significant challenges uh, on that road. Um, but I think people ultimately want to save the euro. I'm sorry that there's a lot of people offering, but I'm afraid we've come to a point where we've really got to uh, bring the question and answer session to an end. And uh, if you wouldn't mind sitting down, I'll thank you. Thank you.